Funding for Indiana Weekend is provided by Midas, Fine Line Construction, and Open Door Health Services. This is Indiana Weekend, some of the most interesting people and places from around our region. These are the stories you won't always see on the regular news, voices you won't always hear elsewhere. I'm John Strauss. This is a kind of news magazine show with stories just a bit off the beaten path. Today, something of a video birthday card. Indiana celebrates its bicentennial this year. You may have seen some of the bicentennial torch run that wound through more than 3,000 miles in every county in the state. A reminder of the variety and vitality of Indiana's different regions. This is a good time to talk about the state's history, the stories of a territory carved from the wilderness, of the Native American peoples, of the strong personalities on both sides. James H. Madison is an emeritus professor of history at Indiana University. He has a new book out called Hoosiers, A New History of Indiana. Every state likes to feel like we're special in some way. Professor Madison talks about the specialness of Indiana. Indiana had formed, this mixture of peoples had formed into a special people. They were not Southerners, they were not Northerners, they were Hoosiers, they were different, even different from people in Ohio or Illinois or Kentucky, Hoosiers. So I argue that we were a distinctive people by 1900. I think we remain a distinctive people. Even in this world where some argue the whole world is flat, globalization has made everything the same and uniform and homogeneous, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. And the case in point for me is that Hoosiers are not like Texans, thank God, or Californians, or New Yorkers, or even Kentuckians. We have a distinctive culture. Long before that distinctive culture formed, this was a wilderness, as anyone stepping off an Ohio River flatboat onto the Indiana frontier would have seen. Well, the first thing I think would astonish us immediately when we get off the boat on the Ohio River is, my goodness, there are trees here. Big trees, lots of trees. In fact, so thick, so heavily wooded that it was difficult for the first people to navigate through those forests. It was difficult to find your way. People got lost all the time in the forests of Southern Indiana. There's a big canopy of leaves in season. It's very dark in there. There are wild animals, bears, all sorts of other dangerous things that can happen. So in some ways, it's a very scary kind of place at the very beginning. Ray Boomhauer, an editor with the Indiana Historical Society, has written several books about state history and is still not sure exactly what the Indiana character means. That's something that's uh, kind of puzzled me, and especially with the Bicentennial, I've thought about that. What is it about Indiana that's different from other states in the Midwest, the old Northwest states like Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin? And one of the things a lot of people turn to in the state is the nickname Hoosiers. It's something that sets us apart from other parts of the Midwest, but I think we pay too much attention perhaps to that word and trying to find out you know, where did it come from? How did it get here? Instead of thinking more about what does it really mean to be a Hoosier? What's the Hoosier character? And it's something that I think people should think more about, give more attention to as the bicentennial uh, comes to an end here. Ah, uh, the name Hoosier. Rarely has so much been written on something about which so little is known. We know it goes back to 1833, at least, when the term was used in a Cincinnati newspaper article. The explanation at that time was that a Hoosier was a boatman on the Ohio River. A few years later, in the 1840s, the term surfaced in a poem by John Finley called The Hoosier's Nest. It's been speculated it comes from Who's Here, called out to people approaching an isolated cabin. History is most interesting when it's about stories and about the personalities connected with the state's character and its development. Take the Hoosier poet, for example. In a way, I think that James Whitcomb Riley had a bigger influence on the state than people even realize today in how Hoosiers view themselves. That, uh, you know, we're a country folk. 
that we enjoy the bucolic old swimming hole and going to old Aunt Mary's. Even when Raleigh was writing his uh, poetry in the uh, early 20th century, Indiana was no longer a farm state. It was an industrial giant with the natural gas boom of the 1890s bringing more manufacturing to the state. The growth of the automobile with people like, uh, of course, the Duesenberg, Studebaker in South Bend, Carl Fisher developing the Indianapolis Motor Speedway here in Indianapolis. The automobile was king in Indiana for a time. But that was already nostalgia. By Riley's time in the late 1800s, Indiana was really a manufacturing state. The gas boom of the 1880s that lured the Ball Brothers to Muncie. Later, the growth of the auto business. Indiana riders began to chronicle that change. If you want to look at the, how Indiana changed, the way that we went from uh, maybe a farm state uh, to the industrial uh, might that we had in the early 20th century, you know, there's no better novel to read than Booth Tarkenton's Magnificent Ambersons, because that talks about, you know, the growth of the automobile and the way that Indianapolis itself changed. And that's a fictional look at how the state changed. One of Boomhauer's favorite books about state history is John Bartlow Martin's Indiana, an interpretation. And although, you know, Martin was not a historian, he was a freelance writer and a former newspaper reporter, I think he captured in that one book uh, a lot of good information about what Indiana was, uh, maybe some of the things that might have gone wrong in the state that uh, stopped it. He kind of had the view that Indiana kind of suffered from hardening of the arteries uh, in the early 20th century after its golden age of literature, uh, the uh, development of the automobile, and the entrepreneurs that were involved in that. Martin was a former newspaper man from Indianapolis who became a nationally successful magazine writer. His book looks at different sections of the state, and likewise, Boomhauer and others have their favorite places. New Harmony, where the uh, two social experiments uh, went on uh, early on in Indiana's uh, history with uh, George Rapp and his uh, followers, Robert Owen and his boatload of knowledge. That's a, a great place uh, to visit, and they've done a great job in keeping that town historically accurate, so you can really get a sense of what those communities were like. Another uh, great place to visit uh, I think is uh, the Calumet region, uh, going up to the Indiana Dunes. And uh, Indiana's natural history is preserved very well, uh, thanks to the uh, people who were uh, fighting to keep the dunes uh, preserved for many years and make it into uh, a national lake shore. So it's another great uh, part of the state uh, to visit. Some places, he says, help bring back that sense of what the state was once like. Any state park in Indiana is that way, but my favorite is Turkey Run State Park because it's one of Indiana's first uh, state parks thanks to the centennial uh, celebration in 1916. And when you go there and, and hike on the trails, I think you become uh, closer uh, to Indiana and what it might have been like you know, during uh, the pioneer days, perhaps. You kind of get lost sometimes uh, on the trails there and I just thank, uh, thank God for Richard Lieber and the others who were involved in uh, helping preserve that uh, for future generations of Hoosiers. You can also capture that sense of the past in places like Vincennes, the territorial capital, and in the Ohio River communities like Madison. Because of course the Ohio River was a major route for transportation, that's how people usually got to the state, by the river or through tough journeys over land and how important that southern part of the state was to Indiana's early history. Cordon, New Albany, Madison, Vincennes, of course. Also, the history that went on there. Go to William Henry Harrison's Grouseland home in Vincennes, where a major meeting and the conflicts that went on between the early settlers and the Native American tribes that were still in the state battling for their very livelihoods. And you can get a sense of that kind of tension and the altercations between the settlers and the Native Americans by visiting a place like Grouseland. The meeting at Grouseland was between two major Indiana figures, William Henry Harrison and Tecumseh, the Shawnee chieftain. You had 
tensions on both sides. Uh, it looked like at one point where there was going to be an altercation, a violent outburst by some of the Native Americans who accompanied Tecumseh. And uh, tensions finally were calmed down and uh, the conversations went, went on. But it's a fascinating look at the two sides of, of, uh, of the uh, conflict at that time, the two sides of the issue between the Native Americans with Tecumseh and uh, Harrison, who was uh, promoting uh, the settlement of, of the state early on in this history. Today, we sometimes forget about the influence of the original people here, the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and others who once called this home. It's a great irony that we have a state named for Indians in which there are no Indians. Now, that's not quite true because there's some Native American peoples in Indiana, we know that, but not very many. We know much more about the Native American story from the very beginnings, and especially from Territorial Governor William Henry Harrison, who arrived here in 1800 with two missions. The major mission was to eliminate the Indians from this part of the world. And he and his successors did that very well, very successfully. By the 1830s, 1840s, most of the Native Americans had been removed, forcibly removed from Indiana. It is, from many angles, a great tragedy. Early on, there were good relations between the Europeans and Indians. There were efforts on the part of some of the first folks here from the East to work with Native Americans, to, for example, teach them how to farm, to convert them to Christianity. None of that worked real well. Uh, there were periods of peace. There was interactions of peace and neighborliness, but there was also hostilities. Hostilities that resulted in death, in, in real armed conflict and bloodshed. I guess one of the great examples in Indiana history is the Pigeon Roost Massacre where families were killed by Native Americans, but there are other examples of that. And then of course there's the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811, where Native Americans have their last actual military resistance to these invaders from across the Appalachian Mountains. They lose that battle. We now know that's the end of the story, the beginning of the end of the story, the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811. Madison says researchers have learned much more about the Native American culture in recent years. Even though most Native Americans did not read and write English, scholars have found ways to tell their stories and to have an appreciation, for example, for Tecumseh, who I believe is one of the great leaders of all time, not just Native American leaders, a very sophisticated American leader with a vision, a strategy. The fact that he lost the fact that he's part of the losing side in this clash of cultures doesn't make him any less than a leader, doesn't make his position, his culture, any less. We now can understand that. We can tell those stories in a way that 50 years ago we couldn't tell. Tecumseh and his half-brother, the Prophet, are among the most remarkable personalities in state history. We now have good biographies of both of them and of the larger movement. What makes Tecumseh so brilliant is that he had an answer to the basic problem, which was that there wasn't one Indian people. There were many, many, many Indian peoples, different tribes, Miami, Potawatomi, the two big ones in Indiana, but many other Native American groups, clans. So all kinds of Native Americans, they didn't speak the same language always. They didn't disagree. They went to war among themselves. They differed in fundamental ways. Tecumseh's vision was that the Indians needed to work together to defend their land. These foreigners are coming. These Europeans, these Americans are invading our land. They're coming across the Appalachian Mountains. The only hope we have is if we unite in a pan-Indian Confederacy and we resist, we force them back. We make better negotiations in our treaties because of course Harrison and others are negotiating treaties with Indians that are very much to the disadvantage of those who signed the Native American treaties. Tecumseh's vision here was brilliant, and he just might have succeeded. He had some bad luck along the way, not necessarily succeeded in keeping this land for Native Americans for all time, but succeeded in getting a better deal for them in this negotiation between two cultures. So I have great respect for Tecumseh. Another Native American leader was Kick the Weenan, or Chief Anderson, for whom the city in Madison County is named. 
I guess Chief Anderson today is most well known to Hoosiers as the father of Mikingas, uh, who married William Connor. That story, which is so wonderfully told at Connor Prairie, this American American, William Connor, marrying a Native American, the daughter of a chieftain, uh, for very good reasons, and having a handful of children with her. Uh, that, however, as times change, as the Native Americans are turning out to be the losers in this struggle, Mr. Connor at one point says goodbye, honey, and sends her off with the children west. Stays here, marries a American woman soon after, and has more children with her, and becomes one of the most prosperous men in central Indiana. That house he built, Connor Prairie, the Connor House in the early 1820s may be the first and the largest brick house in central Indiana. In a list of intriguing historical Hoosiers, you also have to consider some of the state's governors. We've had some very interesting governors. My favorite is Oliver P. Morton, governor during the Civil War. I think he's the greatest governor in the history of Indiana. Indiana could have gone away during the Civil War as a Union force. Lots of Hoosiers by 1863 were not very eager to continue to fight against the Confederacy. Morton made sure that Indiana stayed in the war and contributed immense amounts of men and materials and resources to defeating the Confederacy. And Morton did that in a very sophisticated political way. He often did it with an iron fist, not even a velvet glove around that iron fist. He just pushed it through. It was leadership. It was leadership matched by Abraham Lincoln's leadership in the White House. So at this, the most perilous time in our history, we're blessed to have a great leader in the State House, Oliver P. Morton, a great leader in the White House, Abraham Lincoln. And this is the time to say, never ever forget where Abraham Lincoln grew up. He grew up in Indiana. Lincoln was a Hoosier. So two Hoosier greats. Well, there's always more to learn. History is always changing. Some people think wrongly that history is carved in stone and it stays that way for all time. Go back and read a history book published 100 years ago or 50 years ago and you'll see how out of date it is, how wrong it is in its perspective, if not always its facts. We've learned so much about the history of Indiana in the last 30 years. New versions of old stories like George Rogers Clark, the story of Clark is very different from the one we knew in 1979 when we had Clark on our license plate, but new stories the most important news stories to me are the stories of African Americans. We now know, it's obvious, that there were African American pioneers in Indiana. The default was white. All pioneers were white 50 years ago. We now know that's not true. There were Hoosier, black Hoosiers living in Madison and Evansville. There were black Hoosiers living in rural settlements across Indiana, in Lyle Station in Gibson County, in Roberts Settlement, in Hamilton County in the Weaver Settlement in Grant County. These were African-American pioneers in the 1830s and 40s, free men and women, farming, building churches, building schools, doing the things that, Af that white American Americans did, but they were African-American. When you include their stories into the general story, the whole story changes, the perspective changes. When you include others, people defined as others, at any point in time. African Americans, women, immigrants, LGBT people. When you include their story in the main story, the main story changes and that's why history changes. And to me, that's why history is so interesting. Storytelling has always been part of the fabric of Indiana, including the telling of stories by film. We visited a film set south of Muncie recently. The crew from Chicago was making a movie called The Pale Man in a Delaware County bean field. We talked with director John Lurchin and actress Taylor Bostwick. 
I play the role of Abigail, and she's a young woman, and she's traveling, um, and she gets into a small accident. She has an issue with her car, and so she's stuck in this town until she can get her car fixed. And while there, she um, uncovers a mystery that she tries to solve, and she's mysteriously getting sicker and sicker. And it, it doesn't have to do with the it does that have to do with the mystery that she's solving, what's happening, and uh, she has to figure it out before time runs out. We need it for this shot. For this shot. This is my third feature. Uh, typically I dabble in drama or romances, sometimes uh, some comedy, but this is a mystery thriller, a little bit of horror, uh, so it's a new genre for me. Well, there's not too many films made in Indiana. Uh, since I grew up here, I, I love to bring my work down here. The state is slowly growing. I think we have like three to four features shot here a year, little low budget indies. It's a great environment to work in. Everyone's so friendly no matter where you go in the state. Muncie's been great to us. I'd heard of Muncie before from, I have a few friends who went to Ball State and they speak very highly of Muncie and then also the TV show Parks and Recreation is one of my favorite shows and one of the characters' favorite place in the world to visit is Muncie, Indiana. It, well, this is my first feature length film. It's a different genre for me as well as John. I haven't done a thriller or suspense before, mostly romance and drama. And speaking of first times, I learned how to drive stick for this movie. I drive a pretty neat uh, Ford Falcon, which was very exciting. <laughs> Taylor Bostwick of Chicago on the set of The Pale Man, South of Muncie, directed by John Lurchin. It should be finished by next summer. Finally today, we end on a note of nostalgia. The love of trains is celebrated in the small Indiana town of Atlanta in Hamilton County, north of Indianapolis. It's here that Liz and Steve Nelson opened their train shop, Mr. Muffin's Trains. It's a store and a celebration of model train culture. The Nelsons do a booming mail order business, and on a busy day during Atlanta's annual festival, the store was crowded with train fans and with people just curious about the hobby. I think it's that sense of nostalgia. It's something that we've lost. There's a sort of romance to a train. I think everyone can remember stopping the railroad track and counting cars. I think that all the movies we grew up with, whether they were westerns or they were romantic, they had a train in them. You know, if you think of uh, White Christmas or Holiday Inn, there was a train. If you think of any western you ever watch, they were robbing a train or they were on a train or the Wild Wild West when they had their beautiful, beautiful um, decked out private car. And there's that fantasy to it. When we get our nursing home groups or our church groups that come through, we get these senior citizens, they will look at our collection, they'll look at the engines, and they'll say, oh, I remember riding the Green Crescent from Chicago to St. Louis. And they'll tell their stories. It's so heartwarming to have that connection. And for the multi-generational groups that come through, there's something that ties everyone together. Steve Nelson teaches business at Butler University and is a former IT executive with H.H. Gray. He says everybody understands the connection between trains and Christmas. Trains have always been linked with Christmas ever since Lionel built the first display layouts for the big stores in New York in 1903. And the idea that you would have a train running around a Christmas tree started in 1903. So, uh, you know, that's forever linked. Kids today see trains as dinosaurs. Kids love dinosaurs. Kids love trains just as much. I mean, there are kids that like trains more than dinosaurs. So to them, it's kind of a dinosaur. You know, it's just a big metal dinosaur. And, uh, you know, when they see a real train, you know, a big, you know, see the 765 in Fort Wayne or a big train at one of the museums, it's very impressive. It's like a big dinosaur, you know? Uh, so kids, I mean, kids have that same passion for them. He has more than 4,000 cars in his collection, high-tech trains with computer chips in the engines you can control with an iPad. This is more than just the little train around the Christmas tree. There's a lot of people that are in the hobby don't talk about they're in the hobby, you know, and we have a lot of doctors and lawyers and rich and famous people that have beautiful collections and beautiful layouts and they don't tell anybody, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. Why? Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether they think people make fun of them or... I mean, I didn't tell people I was collecting trains, you know, until I started showing my trains to the public. And people would come in and go, you're kidding, you know? So that's kind of the nature of the hobby. 
It can be an expensive hobby at the high end, but there's still an attraction at some level for young folks. And now we're seeing everything old is new again. You know, I know that my son's generation is all back to the hippie thing and, you know, aren't they thrilled? Universally, we're seeing young, young people, five, six, seven, eight, they're not just playing with model trains, they are learning the history of trains and they're translating that to their modeling. So trains teach. They absolutely teach STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and we really promote that. We just feel that it's so important. You have to have science in your wiring and how the trains work in engineering with the chips that are in all this modern technology. We're now running on a, an app for your iPad or your smartphone, so they're running on an app so you have that technology. And what I love about that is it's passive learning. They don't know they're learning something. <laughs> so being, you know, I taught adjunct for a while and I've raised children and I'm telling you, if you can get something that they're interested in that's teaching them something they don't know about, it's golden. It's just golden. Even if you're not a collector, the meticulous detail of some of these model train layouts is remarkable. They are artwork inhabited, brought to life by chugging scale model machines from another era and a simpler time. That's our show for today. Thanks for being with us. Hope you'll join us next time as we head out to find more stories off the beaten path from across the state on Indiana Weekend. Funding for Indiana Weekend is provided by Midas, Fine Line Construction, and Open Door Health Services.